just go do our thing, okay? And then come back on yourself. Hmm. No. And it will take wow. out a... Wow. Oh, that's lovely. There you go. Try that. Hello, everybody. We are just waiting for eight o'clock before we get going seriously. Um, welcome if there's anybody there watching us so far. There's nobody here at the moment. Oh, right, okay. So I don't have to worry. We don't have anybody. I'll tell you when there are people. Okay. Right. Yeah, if nobody wow. joins us. Oh, well, they will just chat and have fun. That's it. So if you need to get it out, then just come, come across it and it will just come out. But it allows you to do really, if you have to ever cut a grid, yeah, it's yeah. a really good way of cutting a grid. Wow. But if you want to play with one, I'll give you one of the student ones to have a take away. And oh, great. And have a good play with it. Are we in the room yet? We've got three, there are three, three people. Excellent. Where one are of we? those is us. Oh, right. Oh. Okay. Not long to go now till eight o'clock, and we can say hello properly and get started. That's absolutely wonderful. It's a good knife, isn't it? Yeah. I would encourage all lino people to have a go with that. We'll have a chat. So where it. did you you got this, so in, this in is Japan? A ja well, yeah, but you can buy them in the UK. Okay. But it's for what cutting the outline of a, the Japanese woodblock. So it's called a hangito. Hangito. Yes, H A N G I hyphen T O. T O is knife. Um, and hmm. they're just really good precision tools for getting into corners and things like that for lino. These angles are quite interesting, huh? Yeah, I've got different ones. I've got the like, way they that sharpened. one's sharpened to do a straight line. So this oh. one will only cut straight lines. Oh. They're really beautiful. Right, are we at eight o'clock? No, not quite. Wow. Minute left. Minute left, okay. Oh yeah. That's lovely. It's a good tool to have. Hmm. You know, stuff like your rigging. Yeah, exactly. And I always, you know, I struggle. You could actually see it there to get that line yeah. straight. Yeah. So, I'm, you know, I'm using this while I was using the smaller one. Yeah. Uh, I actually have a smaller one. And, yeah, you just can't. And if you're really trying to get Thin, it's just so easy and then oh it's gone oh yeah. no yeah there well yeah. that would yeah. solve the problem I think that's incredible right oh is it <laughs> it's nearly there oh, close oh, 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 oh. oh well I'll practice yeah oh, let me try try one of these wow so we have 14 viewers. 14 viewers, place. fantastic, and welcome. And it's so now 8 o'clock, so welcome everybody, and great to see you in the studio. Um, as before, we're gonna ask you to use the chat function to talk to us, and we will read out questions so that, because we're gonna record this and it'll be on my channel later, we're gonna make sure that everybody knows what questions are being asked. So we'll read out any questions that you type there. So while we were getting ready, I was just introducing Josh to the Hangito knife, a uh, Japanese woodblock knife that you hold in your fist to cut with. Um, and it's, it's quite a precision tool and he's gonna have a go with that. Cause we thought one of the things that we talk about um, tonight was cutting so we've both got examples of our cutting here to discuss and we've got some questions that people have asked well, up front. Rather than start off with the questions do you think it would be good if we got in really close on uh, the use of a hangito before yeah, we could do. We could do. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, can we? Can we get in first? Can we get in first with a bit of publicity about things that are coming up? Because that that would be good to do, wouldn't it? Because we we have we are opening our studios, aren't we? Yeah, a, very exciting. I know, I know. Well, we're opening for Spring Fling, which is the Open Studios event um, in Dumfries. And, is it just Dumfries and Galloway, is it? Mm, yeah. It's the broader Dumfries and Galloway. Yeah, it's, that's um, right. It's all the way from Stranra to Longholm. 
That's right. And it's a it's a really nice open studio. It's a curated one, so you have to kind of get in, be selected for it. And the dates of that are 27th to the 29th. But if you are one of the people watching this on live stream because you live abroad or whatever, um, then I will be doing a live stream on the Thursday night, which is the 26th, I think, or the 25th or the 26th. Um, so there'll be a live stream of this Open Studios event. But if you're in the area, then Kukubri, where we both live, is a real hub, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We've got, I don't know how many artists it's in town. It's almost 100 this year, and yeah. you won't regret it. Um, when, yeah, when we came the very first time, we loved it so much we we bought a house in a studio so <laughs> it's a bit extreme. be careful yeah <laughs> yeah you might end up at, at living at printmaker's corner with us so, Ooh, yeah, well now good. there's a challenge yeah absolutely yeah there's a few properties that would be perfect for fellow printmakers in the town so so spring fling is uh certainly one coming up the other couple of things that i wanted to mention is my dear friend mara cosolino who you might know from social media she is a Japanese woodblock printmaker and she does amazing prints um, and she's based in Italy. She teaches as well and she is coming from the 10th to the 15th of June. So we are going to have a little show of her work here at, um, at the print house and we're also again going to do a live stream with her. So Mara will be around if you want to see all things Japanese woodblock and ask her some questions and that's in June. So that's something else to look forward to. And um, I think we could probably kick off now with a bit of, a bit of cutting, bit do you of think? A little bit of close up mm -hmm. stuff. So if I get Ben, is good. We've, got, right. we've got several cameras on at the moment, so. Great view. Good, yeah, that's a good view. I'm going the wrong <laughs> way. I was going to wave at you, but I'm going the wrong way. Okay. So what we're going to do is we have this knife here. Now, if you have ever bought a set of tools and wonder what this slopey knife is in your set of tools, um, it's a hangito and it's fantastic for cutting lino. It's really designed for Japanese woodblock, but it's really, really excellent for cutting lino as well. So if you buy a set of tools, um, it will come with a long handle like the rest of the tools. But the reason this is a short handle is that we've cut the handle off because you hold it in your fist. So if I can show you, um, I'm bending my arm here a little bit. It's held in the fist and it's just the tip of the blade. So I have um, some stained lino here and I'm just going to cut a little bit out with this knife. Are you okay there? Can you get, shall I turn a bit? Because so, Josh hasn't come across this um, knife it's before. Decided. Oh. I've, I've hit the wrong button here. Sorry, I'll just let Ben get organised. You got it? Um, You're going up. Uh, there we go. We can <laughs> back into focus now. Okay. Okay. So you see it's held in my fist. And the long point is towards my knuckle and the short point towards the back of my wrist. And I'm just going to use the tip of the blade and I'm coming into the lino and just bringing it along. If you, Lots of people use scalpels with lino. This is sort of like that. I like it very much because it's very precise. And I'm just following the ink line here and to make my first cut. And note the other finger from the other hand. Yes, that's a good Which point. is the guide. That's right. So I'm stabilizing everything and I'm coming back on myself now. And hopefully you can see I'm releasing a little sliver of material there. And it's really handy as a precise tool for getting a little tiny bit there. Um, Does that look clear to you on the screen, Joshua? Yes, absolutely perfect absolutely on the screen. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. It so looks perfect. So if you have, you, you, it's especially good with grids, actually, with little things like if we go down here, let's look at that. Um, I've got two little tiny bits here that I need to cut out. So I can get in there 
and make those two little cuts and then I'm just flipping it and you see the blade is going in at an angle and I'm just going to come around again so I'm moving the lino rather than the blade and just releasing those little tiny tiny and you see how that's taken out those two little tiny bits there mm. I tilt it up a little bit that's wonderful it's a really really handy if I put my finger in you can see that's tiny mm, you so can see it's it a really clearly. really nice little precision blade to use and you'll find those you can buy them individually but you will also find them in any sets uh, like power tool sets often have one in and those blue boxes of budget tools that you can buy um, okay. of five tools. Can you just run the tool along one of the straighter lines yeah, just course. to show people how? Okay, how so I'm going to run works. it along this line and I don't want to undercut the line. I want to cut it a bit of a slope. So I'm going to come in. You can see I'm at an angle there, so I'm away from the the lino and I'm just going to cut along and take my time and I'm just using the tip of the blade just to run along and then I'm going to turn the lino around and come back on myself and just there's a little bit of ink there that I want to show and you can see that's giving me a lovely precise little cut there so it's a very nice tool that so excellent yeah i recommend a hangito as part of uh your japanese uh part of your lino kit for cutting lino and now ben is trying to get out of the um confusion of cameras so that we can go back to the main screen have we got oh, the chat there's up? angela yeah <laughs> uh, hang on a second. yeah Ben's just <coughs> not put the chat on yet, so we can't see if any of you are saying hello or asking you, questions. No, I'm afraid you won't see the chat. Oh no, you can talk about us and we it. won't see it, so you can kind of say rude things about us to Ben and Angela, who are so behind, we, behind we the have, camera. We have a number of greetings from various Oh, that's people. nice. Um, and uh, Phyllis Baker wants to know if we'll be talking about maintaining carving tools. I think Ooh. not this time. Well, a little bit. We can do a little bit towards the end. I will hop up and get my my stuff for that. Um, we don't have any direct questions other than we'll be talking about maintaining tools. So for the time being, yeah. perhaps you should... We can, we can start off with some of the ones that have been... Yeah. Right, okay, so I have got a question. Let's start with, oh, um, how do you get your inspiration? I really struggle with mental block. I have ideas, but my mind goes blank when I get to my desk. So how do you come up with the idea for a good print? And how do you know what's going to make a good print? I'm going to ask you first, put you on the spot. <laughs> I, um, I go out and and find the inspiration. So I um, go what what I call um, landscape hunting trips, um, whether it's a walk or a drive or um, I actually physically go and find it. And I know what kind of light conditions I like. So I'm quite lucky that I can I can put the by appointment sign on uh, at my studio door with a telephone number. And then off I go, and uh, and it becomes really important part of my job, um, and I like to go and find it. I mean, I love I love walking, and when I'm walking around with my camera, um, there's already a serious inspiration uh, that happens. Hopefully. Um, because I'm already prepared for the kind of conditions that that's going to happen, and 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 then there's consideration of a lot of things before I get into the studio. Um, obviously, the first one is is uh, is light, which is why I'm out there. Um, mood in in a specific direction, or when the cloud comes, or there's you know some rain or mist. Um, and then, of course, tone, color, and composition. I mean, I'm I'm already playing around with mm. with that kind of thing 
when I'm out there. Mm. So, uh, oh. sorry, Ben's oh. put us on two speakers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, uh, when I'm out there, all these things are considered, and then I come back after hopefully a, a wonderful shoot, and um, I have 100, 200 images that I choose one mm. of, and um, and then okay. and then this is then the inspiration that that leads me for a, a two and a half weeks project in the yeah. studio. Yeah. But you're very businesslike about it in the sort of, you know what you're looking for and you know, you seem very sort of organized about. Yeah, you know, I've, um, I, I remember at university, uh, I remember the one, one artist at uni, um, had this idea that um, this 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 might seem a bit crude, um, but it is it nine o'clock yet? Um. No, it's not nine o'clock yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I better watch my language. Yeah, it's going to be somewhere. By somewhere anyway, um, he um, he said that you know his art pieces are his prostitutes, and he is the pimp, and he doesn't care what they look like. As long as he sells them, Ooh, that's, that's not my idea. No, 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 you know. So it actually takes yeah. all. So yeah. I've always thought that, you know, there is some things that I love to do. Yeah. There's a huge range of things that I love to do. A small percentage of that range will sell, mm. and that's what I focus on. Yeah. Um, I do play around with some other bits you know at other times of the year but you have to be realistic if you want to survive in the world and and eat and and uh, you know pay rent or whatever mm -hmm. your mortgage so um i've always been quite pragmatic about it but also make sure that it falls into that passion as well i was going to you know, say yes if it's, it, there, there must be an really overlapping bit of course thing. I can't uh, create something just purely because, oh God, it's going to sell. Yes, I'm going to sell loads, they but never I hate do, it. They do though. You know, That's the I thing. Can't yeah. Do. Yeah. So um, I think as long as you find that that middle ground. I think and so. You? I think for me, um, I mean, I go out into the landscape, and like Josh, I kind of have a, a an idea of what I like to work with. And like Josh, I take a camera and sometimes I take a sketchbook and, and I do drawings and I take loads of photographs. And I think it's what I find is that when I come back into the studio, I have to draw until the idea emerges. So I'll do thumbnails and I'll do sketches and I'll do designs and sometimes I will look directly at photographs sometimes I'll just make do with what is in my head until I find something that I really want to work with but I think that it's something that I just I know if I keep going enough then I will get there. Oh, he's going to he's going to Just show to show you how beautiful ooh, this ooh, ooh. is. Let's ooh. see if we can tilt it's it. It's gone so. very wide. It's gone very wide. Look at those beautiful drawings. <laughs> so this is what she's talking about. So let's see if I. If I was I looking at them right and admiring them. Oh, oh, Ben's going to rescue us with that. Ah. ah. Right, okay, so I can Isn't that incredible? How oh, lovely. Camera. So that's what you're so talking about. So this is about. the kind of scribble. Yeah, yeah, this is the kind of scribble that I do. But I have to, in answer to the, the lady who asked, there isn't a sort of, it's not like we kind of, I see the image and I'm struck with this beautiful idea and it all flows. A lot of it is simply, I draw until it comes out. It's like a process of just drawing and, and trying and trying and trying. And then suddenly something will click that excites me about that landscape. And then once I've got that to hang on to, then I can start developing a, the big design for the print. But like Josh says, you know, there are certain things that I like that won't sell, like, you know. Mm. Um, mm. But the things that will sell, you have to really be passionate about. Because if you're just doing yeah. it because you think somebody will like a nice picture, then 
it won't come across well mm. somehow there is a kind of you have to mm. care you have to really want to do it so yeah I yeah, have I mean, to work at that people people would ask me if 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 I do um, you know if, if someone has a, an, an idea um, and, and someone gives me a commission to do something and I tell them I do it very rarely because I have to have a passion for yeah, it. Yeah, you can't just turn I can't it just off. say, okay, yeah, well, great. This is like another, like so many, you know, pounds in the bank. It's not the point. The point is I have to be passionate. Otherwise, I'm going to create something really terrible. So, yeah. Yeah, that really shows. So I think that, that probably answers that question. Um, if we have, have we got... I don't know if we've got any other questions. We have a question here. Oh, right. Do you ever start on, on one that has clicked and then realise it isn't work, working after all? Uh, yes, that does happen occasionally. Um, and thank you, Moro, for that. It's, it's, I think, for me, just occasionally. Usually what happens is that... Um, Either it happens really early on in the drawing, in which case it's like, so what? Or there are times when I will get th through, and it does, I mean, I, it's only happened a handful of times, but I'll actually get to nearly the end of the print and then I'll suddenly think, actually, do you know what? I don't like this. And once, there's, that's very different from, I'm really struggling with this, because really struggling with the print often leads to a really good outcome. But, once you take against a print, it's almost impossible to work with that print, or at least in my uh, in my head it is. I, mean, I don't know. How do you feel about that? You don't. Do I you have a... um, I have so much considerations before I start. So I, yeah, I have so know. many images, so many pictures that I that, that I go through and select to that beautiful one that that I find so passionate. You know. Uh, such such beauty in it um but uh, almost almost all prints that i do somewhere it's a two and a half pro week process for me mm. so almost all prints that i do somewhere in that two and a half weeks i'm like oh no i've messed it up oh no i've i've i've, I've done something really terrible or and then you know you carry on because it's what you do, and yeah. then and then yeah, and they then come you, good in the end. They come good yeah. in the end, and you're like, wow, what, what was I thinking? Yeah, I would never give up on anything that I was. It's it's as I say, it's very different. The um, I suppose about with my prints, maybe like forty or fifty percent of it is out of my head. So I I'm kind of pulling things together and creating this imagined world. Um, and and if it's a, a sort of technical struggle or something like that, like Josh is saying, you know, you get to a point where you're thinking, how am I going to make this work? That's mm. that's fine, and I always would say persist with that. But yeah, if you don't like it anymore, then nothing's going to make you love it mm. really. Mm. And then I I I trash it and start again. But that that doesn't happen very often, mercifully. But I do. Um, the, I don't know how many of you know uh, the the golf player Gary. Uh, golf, yeah, the, the golfer Gary Player um, always used to say, and I love it. Um, he used to say that the more he practices, the luckier he gets. Yeah, that's very. And I love that <laughs> because you know, you know, you always think, oh no, something terrible's gone wrong. But the more I work at it, and um, over the years, yeah, you can pull things you know, back. You, yeah, you it's just amazing. Have that amazing. experience of, yeah. Okay. Right. If we have. Okay. There, there are a few more questions c coming in here. Okay. Um, Greenwood and Leathercraft says, I'm new to lino print and need to understand more about creating texture. What exercises would you suggest? Have you got your sampler somewhere? I have. Actually, I'm going to hop up and get that. I'm going to let you show yes. your textures yes. while I go and get my sampler. Yeah, I um, I often just let the image dictate. Um, I I do like to try. I mean, recently um, last year I did a print of uh, of gorse, uh, a certain type of plant. I don't know where you are from, um, and the 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 leaves are really spiky. So you know, um, I would use 
a V shape uh, chisel for the very spiky sharp leaves um, and then I like to use maybe smaller chisels for you know water texture in the distance or or if if I'm doing pebbles and I like to use a really big V so I think it's it's important to remember to use your range of range of, of chisels as well um, um, I, I find that often I get stuck on one chisel which I love and then I sort of forget and then I realize oh if I use this other chisel that texture would would actually look so much better so um, play around yeah so yeah if um, I brought this sampler up to oh, show beautiful. you one of the good things to do is to make yourself a sampler I'm going to hold the print of it up to the light so that you can see it let me just get this right I think camera. we're all right I think we're probably okay there. Yeah, so this was good. just an exercise is that better yeah. There we go. Uh, this was just an exercise um, when I was writing the book to show different textures and ideas and playing with it. So if you are new to Lino Cut, then cutting yourself a sampler like this is really good because it makes you try lots of different things. It improves your cutting and it will give you some ideas for textures. It's also a great thing to have to print if you're testing new papers. You've kind of got a, like a stock lino cut that you can use to test papers on and it's it's always the same print so you can you can go to get a good idea for papers the other thing i would say is try lots of different ways of making marks on lino so here is a piece of lino that i've stained pink and i've got various things that i've used to draw on the lino with and this is traditional lino so this is the stuff with the hessian backing and sometimes i use paint brushes to mark up my lino sometimes i use dip pens uh, sometimes i use soft crayons now we're a bit different in the way that we work with me i make marks on lino and then i cut around those marks so my textures are created by the the types of drawing that I do onto the lino uh, and the fact that I'm cutting around either pen or pencil or paint or whatever and that's how I get my textures whereas Josh I think you use a sharpie to work to mm. mark up your mm. lino and then it's mm. the way you use your tools mm. Mm. with that I, yeah I let the, the texture. I let the photograph that I'm working from uh, guide me with um, what chisel to use and then what marks to make I think also the fact we both use traditional lino which has a brittleness and it snaps at the end of each cut is really really important because if you use the easy cut stuff and again I'm going to hold that towards the camera when you cut it these these bits don't snap off you have to cut out at the end of the cut as well and the problem with that is it encourages you to always be using a scooping cut because that's the easiest way to clear material out of this easy cut the, the plastic stuff Do you want a closer view um and no it's, it's okay i think they, they get the point um and that means that you tend to make the same mark again and again and again and then like josh was saying that's the same texture all the time mm. so you mm. get that repeating scoopiness so my advice would be to make yourself a sampler and also try a variety of materials to mark up your lino and like josh says try try to keep changing tools and trying different tools mm. speaking of which i went out while i was out there this is the blue box of tools which seems to be reasonably universal and that one comes as a set of long handle tools um, one of which is a hangito knife so um, I haven't got one in this set, um, but it, it'll come as a long handled tool like that. We were talking about hangitos earlier, so that was a kind of economy box uh, that will have a hangito, which I'm going to send Josh home with one of these tonight to make him practice with. <laughs> um, I there, will. There are some, some other questions here. Um, any tips on managing to translate a 3D view into a 2D lino cut? Oh, interesting. Interesting question. Mm. So I think it depends. If you want to get distance, um, think about the fact that when you are looking at something in real life, 
you have like the most contrast and the punchiest part of the image and the most detailed image is the close up and then at the further back you go not only is the the paler it goes but it's it, there's less contrast so it's more subdued the further back you go so you can create a lot of feeling of distance by controlling that kind of so for example let's say you were doing um some rocks which is like my thing i might in my in my foreground i might have a rock that is is uh maybe four different layers of color and quite bold and then in the middle distance I, I might have a rock that's maybe got three layers of color and is less bold and in the background i might have one that's got two layers and in the far distance i might have one that's just a color and so i can control as i come forward more detail more contrast so it's it, you can actually do things like that which will make a more three-dimensional image mm. what i also do with with cutting is i i also use chisels uh, to to try and get the feel of distance so I would uh, in the distance use a smaller chisel and as I'm heading closer to me uh, whether I'm doing rocks or whatever I'm doing I would use a bigger and bigger chisel oh, so my marks would yeah. would then be bigger and bolder um, um, yeah to but uh, with, with, with tone, I agree with you. Mm. Those lovely tones getting softer and, and less contrasty towards the back. Um, yeah. And also things just being a lot simpler at the mm. kind of mm. back of the view. Absolutely. The front, yeah. I think, yeah. is important. Um, Greenwood and Leather Crafts have come, has come up with two other questions which are, I think, possibly related. How do you create really clean corners? WOB, I assume that's white on black. Um, and then rather than cheap uh, cheap set, what's the best hand keto knife to buy on its own? Okay. And I think those two things might be slightly related. Well, you would know more than me. With corners, there are a couple of things you can do. You can actually use a V to get a nice corner. I'm going to ask Ben to come and film this. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I say that? <laughs> okay. I just need to... It's not a very accurate corner. To the camera. Mm. Okay. Let's come on. I don't use Josh's. So if I had um, to do a corner... Okay, you're right there. Then a neat corner. Then I might start with a V tool and I would actually go in quite high. I get it into the corner and I go in quite bold like so. And then I can get into that very corner and then run up. Let me just get this straight. And then probably come around the other way and run again from that up like so so i'm actually starting in the middle bit and then i can clean away like so to get a, a neat corner and if it's not quite neat enough i can use the side of the tool just to sort of neaten things up that's one way of doing it and then a hangito way of doing it is to get my hangito and then i put the point in the corner and come along and come down into the corner and then hopefully I can just go across here and maybe even if I'm lucky that bit will just pop out and leave me a neat, a neat corner. So if you want hangitos on their own, you can buy um, good quality hangitos as a single tool. I don't know whether you're in the UK. If you are, then uh, Intaglio Printmakers or Hand Printed sell hangitos. They also sell left-handed hangitos. Uh, McLean's is good in America. Um, if you have a look at my resources section of my website, 
then there's a whole list of suppliers on there. Um, but yeah, you should be able to get yourself a hand geese and they cost about 26 quid, something like that. The same as, as a sort of good file tool, I think. And that will give you a good quality hand gito. I would aim probably at the sort of 4 mil, 4.5 mil size rather than the, you can buy these much smaller, um, like two mil jobs um, and they're okay, but they're easier to snap. So I would go with something a little bit sturdier if you were getting one for the first time. So if you want a more crude way of doing it, <laughs> which you're, is me you're bringing, which all is the, me. you're bringing all the class to the evening <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just show you what I do which Go you on, know then. just a different way uh, if you want to uh, I, uh, I should I bring the camera back in again yeah. uh, hang on uh, 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 probably yeah, make him do it's, it to it's the gonna, camera. Oh, so just just the way I do it be, mm. because the lino is is, is brittle um, I would just um, uh, take these out the way uh, there we go I would literally just uh, cut and and cut so oh, you're so bold oh <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and then the other thing that the, that the brittle mm. ones do is um, not as neat, obviously, mm. but if you're working fast and you don't really need to be that neat, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's a, that's a little bit bolder, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm just trying to explain how... Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. But that's a, the point a, a about... A rougher way, yeah. But that's the point about traditional lino. It will do that for you in a way that we couldn't do that on this plastic stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it will make your life so much easier to use traditional lino, I mm, think. And mm. really, for cutting, it's much, much easier to do that. Mm. Um, I've got to read one out here um, from our list of, of questions. Um, somebody was asking about mono printing because both Josh and I create mono prints. Josh really is the, the expert because he's been doing it a lot longer than I have. He kind of showed me what to do. <laughs> and I've, I've, I've been doing a little bit of mono printing. So do you want to explain how you do it? Well, the, the way I, I work, um, I, I actually, um, in, in my career, uh, went through 15 years of, uh, of, of painting oil on canvas. So. My, my brain works a bit like a, a painter's brain and, and for monotypes it, it works really well. So what I would do is decide on, on a, can I, can I draw? No, yeah, I, I don't sure. actually need to draw, but I, I would have a, a piece of plastic. I'm just going to swap over to the GoPro. Okay, yes, it. perfect. Yeah. So I, I would um, have a piece of plastic that I work on, uh, white perspex, and then I would, uh, um, decide on the size of my print which in in the permanent marker I would actually draw on the the perspex and then um, I would have uh, from normally a photograph I would have an, an image that um, that I would then draw uh, um, and that's the, the the thing I wanted to 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 do a monotype of and then I'd have a piece of paper that's bigger than the block, obviously, that I would stick down with masking tape on the one side. So your piece, um, of, your piece of perspex is big. My so, piece of yeah. perspex is, is, you know, is, is much bigger than the whole thing. So the piece of paper is bigger than the block. And then um, this piece of paper is then um, stuck down with masking tape, broad masking tape on the one side. So I flip that and it stays there through the whole process. So that's the only piece of paper that this image will be on. And then around this bit, I would have thinner masking tape and then um, roll a block of ink in that thinner masking tape. And what I would do is I would normally mix in a transparent white, um, which- So extender. An, an extender. Yeah. Which, which then means, and, and I normally play with more than one color per layer, so I would roll up a block of ink with this extender, which then means when I pull off this masking tape, um, 
I have this solid block of ink, but I can see my drawing through through that block of ink. And then I, I wipe that block of ink um, with a cloth over the finger or, or different things. So if things. you wanted a white tree and a coloured background, yeah. you just wipe away, rather than cutting, wipe away the you're ink. wiping. Yeah. Rather than... And then when I'm happy with my drawing, I would put the paper on top, it goes through my printing press, and then that drawing in the block of ink is on the piece of paper. The piece of paper stays there, and then I'd roll another block of ink, a normally darker layer, and I would do another drawing, and I would print the second drawing on the first, and then a third and a fourth and a fifth or whatever. So you're building whatever. up the layers. Building up layers, building up drawings printed on top of each other. So Ben, do you want to pass me the, the big one that I've just drawn, which is a bit of a the, monster, the drawing. The, the drawing on the acetate. So Josh showed me how to do that, and... Um, I do it slightly differently, um, based very much on what he's taught me, and I'm just going to show you one here. I don't, Josh works on opaque sheets of plastic, I don't, I work on clear sheets. So here's one that, um, I'm just going to put a piece of paper behind so you can see it. So here is a one that I'm about to start, Ooh, let's just get that behind it, yeah, there we go. So here's one I'm about to start working on, and I work on this because, unlike Josh, I'm unable to make my mind up, so I change things all the time as I'm working, and this means that I can ink up this very thin acetate sheet, and just like Josh, I have a piece of paper that's attached to it that comes down, and I'm wiping the areas that I want. But it also means that I can, if I am inking up I can make marks on the back as I go. So if I change the rock shape or something, I can redraw it on the back as I go and know where I am with it. I can also shine a light through it. Um, the drawing's actually on the rear of the material, so I can do whatever I like on the front and there's no danger of losing the drawing. So that allows a bit of flexibility. But unlike Josh, uh, who prints his entirely, don't you? I, I draw into mine afterwards, so I work on it afterwards with pencil and pastel yeah. and paint and things. So my mono prints are actually mixed media if you want to be picky about it because they have drawing elements and they have oil pastel elements and things to them, but yours are pure printed work. Mm. Mm. But um, So I think we're sort of both coming from very much the same place, just a slightly mm. different approach. It's a very exciting thing to do. It is. It, it's, it's a very one way. <laughs> it, it's, it's wonderful because it, it's softer. Mm. So it's far more, it's like, it's like a painting in, in print. It's, mm. it's just really very exciting. But also, it, for me, it lets me get my drawing out and get, get drawing on it, which is something, yeah. you know, my prints are always their foundation is in drawing. And it's lovely to be able to actually get onto the paper with a pencil and do some drawing in a final piece of work as well. Um, Daisy Crystal Green says, I have an ink transfer problem onto Gampy. There are minute bumps in the paper that mar an ink transfer. I think I should sand the paper, sand paper the Gampy to ensure smoothness. Is this the right approach? Gampy? So it must be quite lightweight paper, I would have thought. Um, and this is lino printed onto Gampy. Is this with a with a printing press? I think possibly if you're having trouble like that, try a different uh, washi paper because there are loads of washi papers with very smooth surfaces that will accept a lino print. Um, I know Gampy is a lightweight tissue. So I, I think we might I might be misunderstanding because I don't think you could sand it. Um, I think sanding would be a bad. Point, yeah, I would. It would lift that. the fibres. Yeah, it the would. Paper. It would. So what I would say with that is is maybe explore some other washi papers because really, if you have a texture on the paper, it's it's going to to show a little bit. I mean, both Josh and I use a, in our printing presses, we use Rosaspina, which has got a slightly diagonal mm. texture to it. Mm. 
But I was at a show the other day and I can see who uses um, this particular type of paper that's very popular and I can't remember, it's not Reeves, it's the other one. Can you think what it's called? <gasps> uh, Somerset. Somerset no. paper. And there's of a course. particular texture and I can look at people's work and know if they're using Somerset from the finished print. So I think if, you, if you're using a Japanese paper and you're having trouble, try another with a, a, a more accepting surface because there are lots of different types of, of lightweight Japanese papers that should work quite well. Um, Odette John says, have you etched your lino to create texture? I have. I've, I've done it with caustic soda um, and also I've done it with a Dremel, which is quite interesting to use. I used to get, I always used to get offended because when I had open studios, I always used to get a gentleman of a certain age who would come in and tell me that I should be using a Dremel. Um, and I was always a bit huffy about that. And then I did use a Dremel and it's quite interesting. It does provide quite an interesting texture. It's like all these things you have to have a reason to do it. You can't just like, oh, that's a nice texture, I'll just use it. You have to have a mm. kind mm. of... So yeah, I have tried with Caustic and I have used a, a Dremel tool and both of which have been successful in the application for which I needed it. I, um, at university, I did once tried uh, a, a kind of an acid. I can't remember what it was specifically. Um, oh, that sounds very 60s. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, but well, it was, it, I, it was very messy. You, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there, there was a guy at, at uni where, where I, I went to the University of Cape Town and um, he was using an angle grinder. And okay. um, really interesting, very difficult to control, but his, his work was extremely loose. Um, yeah, so... I, th I think it's worth experimenting. I, I probably don't do enough of it. Mm. Um, I'm sort of set in my ways with chisels. I really enjoy it. But uh, but yeah, I, I am open to it. Um, yeah, caustic soda is quite fun to play. I mean, you have to obviously, goes without saying, it's a dangerous substance. So do take it yeah. seriously because you really don't want to get it on your skin or in your eyes or eyes, anything like yeah, that. And yeah. you don't want to breathe it in. But it, it does provide a very interesting texture and some of my prints um i did one recently called sketchbook study winter and that's got like a, a winter snow sky and that's that's all done with etching with caustic soda uh faye kelly tunke says are you going to do jelly plate printing my hands are too weak to hold cutting tools Ooh, i've never done that no, we don't know about I. that. No, sorry. We'll um, have to we'll have to get a jelly plate person to come and visit us so that we can do that. <laughs> so yeah. Of us know. Um, Excuse me, reaching across here, I'm going to grab the glass. Of I um, I have played around with. Uh, you get a very soft. You you probably know more about it than I do. A, a soft, rubbery um, substance to carve into. Uh, pink quite thick, uh, which I once tried, um, not lino. Um, it is something you can find in art stores, which is definitely very easy to cut. But I had a problem printing it, especially when you start cutting away more of the surface. Mm. And when you're putting it through the printing press, it just wants to well, I change think... and spread. But if, you ha if you're having trouble cutting, then I honestly, I would try the mono printing. Try printing yeah, onto absolutely. a sheet of plastic where you're wiping instead of cutting, mm. which I guess is how jelly plate works. I don't know. But there are some good videos out on YouTube of jelly plating. Uh, there's a guy that does loads and loads of them, and I forget what his name is, but there's some good stuff out there. But yeah, I would go down the mono print route yeah, if, you, I if agree. you have trouble cutting. Mm. Um, can you remember whether you've done a video on the sampler and creating textures? I can't remember. I think I've done... I don't think I did one on making a sampler. That Actually, we should make a note of that for when we get back to YouTube filming. Um, but I've definitely done various videos on cutting techniques. Um, 
and I think there might be some about texture in there. Right. Um, I, th I think um, the next question is probably one most relevant to, to Josh. Um, I'm a beginner, I just bought a new etching press, the blankets are quite stiff, how do I soften them? I think you just throw them away. And you well, I... Throw them away <laughs> because they're very expensive. I, um, at university, I've, I've always printed on an etch style press, um, and at university we, we worked with, with blankets. Um, and it's just the way I, I always thought that's that's how you how you work with it. Until recently, I bought a a wonderful press from Ironbridge, a uh, gunning press, and they came and installed. And um, they they don't use a blanket; they use paper. So they use many sheets of paper. Um, they actually use paper that's called uh, bread and butter paper, which I suppose is a, a cheaper paper I'm not sure yeah, it's just um, it's but a stiff paper the, isn't it? yeah quite a stiff paper the beauty of it is that you can take one away or two away and uh, the 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 minute differences in pressure is, is is really quite a nice thing to play with and what I found is as I'm printing uh, with the edge style press the, the the paper moves so um, the lino and your your uh, paper that you're printing on moves less. Uh, that's what what I found. Um, so yes, I I actually uh, rolled up my blanket and um, put it under the bed. So I haven't used it for a while now. Actually, funny <laughs> enough, I'm doing a mono, with the mono printing that I'm doing. I am using a blanket. I'm using okay. a sheet of card and a blanket. Hmm. Um, don't ask me why, because I'm not. Not quite sure, <laughs> but I am using a thicker, a th the the sort of thicker of the two blankets that I've got. Um, well, what I would say though is that um, if you use a blanket with lino with insufficient additional packing, you will get embossing. Yeah, mm. this is for mono yeah. print, not for lino. So that's different. That's on a flat sheet of acetate. So that's not going to happen. But yeah, you're quite right. If you're doing lino, it will inte it will push, especially if you're using a lighter weight paper, it will push it down. The blanket mm. will push mm. it down, which isn't ideal. But the cats like them. <laughs> ah. Can vouch for that. Um, there's a question here about uh, where we got our large sheets of plastic for monoprint. Oh, I'm going to I ask think, Ben that. Well, I, I'm not going to answer it. I'm just going to say we did a lot of searching on the internet. Yeah, and there are loads and loads of companies. Out there. Yeah, so what we were looking for, which is possibly more helpful, is that we were looking for, uh, for my style, I was looking for a one mil, was it one mil acrylic? Uh, or we half were actually mil? looking for half mil. We ended yeah. up with 0 0.75. 0 0.75 mil acrylic sheet. And um, you can buy it in enormous sizes, but you can also buy it cut down. So that's the kind of very flexible, transparent stuff that I'm using, but you use thick stuff, don't you? Mm, mm. Quite. Uh, Quite thick. You use perspex white rather perspex, than yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, but I do want to try the see-through sheet mm -hmm. that you're using because you I, can I, I can adapt on the back. Yeah, I I, I, I quite like the idea. I've just yeah. never worked with it, and uh, yeah, uh, I want to. Mm. So yeah, so that's mm. the beauty of being at Printmakers Corner. You see, oh there's yeah, lots of ideas. Ha, 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 of, lots like of we're it. persistently. <laughs> We need more of you. Come. Yes. Yes, you should come to Kakubri so we can have more at Printmaker's Corner. That would be really great. That would be good. Um, have we got time for a, a sort of... We've got a, a question here about... Um, well, it's, it's sort of two questions that match. One of us is, what advice do you have about colour mixing? Do you keep notes of recipes? And then there's another question, and this is really for Josh, not for me, um, saying, do you go by values to determine what ink in each layer? I don't know how to organise colours and layers. So, yeah, the whole colour shebang, how do you...? The colour, the, the whole uh, colour side of, of printmaking to me is absolutely fascinating, and I love it. I love that every few days I'm going through half my day mixing colors so I use uh, I use the primaries 
and uh, white and then transparent white um, and, and and I actually love mixing them um, and I've come to realize that there is no talent involved it's all learnt it is actually something you can learn um, mixing colors and, and, and I think that's wonderful I think it's, it's, it's mathematical it's um, learning what goes with what and how do you get those beautiful so do you, hues. Do you read about it? Is this something you find instinctive? Or well, I I was quite color theory. And... I was quite fortunate um, at university. We we had a project of, I think it was almost a two week project of uh, mixing a color wheel um, with. Uh, you know all the primaries and then at least five seven in between and going towards the middle to pure white and to the ends to pure black um, and it was a lot of mixing um, and then of course painting while on canvas for 15 years you you practice a lot so um, I love that part of it but you know I'm, I'm, I'm purely guided by my my photographs which is my initial spark and um, and there hasn't been a color that I haven't been able to mix, not because I'm so wonderful, so but because I'm so determined. <laughs> <laughs> so you're referencing the color beside the photo yes. to check. And I always have a a color swab, mm. a, a, a ink swab, where um, I try and try, and then you know the next layer, you mm. try the next one on because you're always mixing one color to create, uh, uh, you know, to put on a second to create a third. Um, they always influence each other. Um, so I, um, yeah, um, I, there, there is no, there is no, uh, yeah, set way before I start. I just, I mix and mix and mix until I get what I want. <laughs> I think for me, um, because I work in washes of colour, uh, I start with a base, you know, sort of very, because I tend to, with when I'm working in colour layers, I'm working from the distance to the foreground in my images as a rule, because as we said before, the foreground is, the, the background is where it's, it's, it's pale, well palest it's the most transparent and there is less contrast going on there so i tend to start when i'm printing at the back of the picture and i come forward building up the colors as i go um i no i must have been away when they did color theory i'm i'm always kind of mm, I don't, I've, I've never been <laughs> I've never done colour wheels and stuff like that. What I do do, though, and what was good practice for me, was that I used to teach a lot of one-to-ones where I would mix the students' inks for them as they were doing what they wanted to do. So I would have, like, a Pantone chart or colour swatches, and I would show them, and they'd say, oh, I want that blue. And then I would match the ink to what they wanted. So a bit like Josh matching to his photographs. That that was a good way of learning. Mm, but now is, yeah. I use a restricted, tend to use a restricted palette. I have a lot of inks hanging on the wall, um, but I only use a few at a time. And I'm always mixing old colour into new colour mm. and, and complicating and, and tipping colours rather than starting with a fresh... Ben's going to embarrass me by showing the wall of inks. Um, <laughs> this is a wall of me walking into shops and thinking, oh, I must have that. And then, um, fortunately, he can't get the camera to work. But yeah, so my colour mixing is very much progressive through the print. And because I work in such transparent layers and many of them, the way the paper shows through the inks affects the colours. Oh, there we go. It's my wall of shame. Um, oh, like, it's beautiful. <laughs> I'd like to point out the ones at the top are for students. Um, but the mucky ones down below, these ones are all my colours. So it's it's very much when I'm, when I'm printing a restricted palette and I'm mixing the colours from the previous layer into the next layer and building on that. I would never like mix one color and then go back to my tubes and cook up another color and then cook up another color it's a much more everything into the mix process um to build up prints i think yeah so it's just blending and blending but like josh says you just mix until and you get a good eye for it mm. 
Mm. I used to keep colour notes when I first started doing this, but I I just found after a while that you kind of get so as you know what you want and you can mix it. I th I think um, there's uh, uh, something that I always do is 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 putting the colour down on the paper that I'm using. Yeah, that's so really good advice. With my palette knife, I'm always scraping whether I'm make, uh, putting it down on the previous colours that I was going to use in previous layers or just by itself in the beginning. And then um, uh, one of the things I always do is I, I have some pure black and it, it's almost always the black nib of my permanent marker that I hold over it. And then I have my photograph that I have next to it on the other side. So I'm relating these three things, the, the color that I want to mix on my photograph the swab I've just put down on the paper that I'm using and the black nib and then I squint my eyes. So the tone is as important as the mm -hmm. colour but um, then you are getting an idea. Are you getting there? Is the colour a bit too red? Is the colour a bit too yellow or whatever? Um, so I constantly do that as I'm mixing and I put a little bit more red and then I try it again on the piece of paper and then I have that black next to it and my photograph and I squint my eyes. So I'm constantly doing this to get the right color. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say when you mm. were talking about distance, mm. um, which I find quite fascinating, um, and this I think is, is light theory or color theory, I'm not sure, but because of um, the the waves of light, light waves, um, as you go further away, there's some colors that fall away so, and some colors are stronger. So if you've ever seen distant mountains and they blue, it's because your eye sees the color that's actually coming from so far away and the blue um, is one of the few that remain. So. You know, you're mm. talking about that mm. softer colors in the distance. Yeah. They become more blue as well. Yeah. So there's all these things that, that is theory that you can read up about. I mean, it's, it's fascinating the human eye and what color does. But uh, yeah, and also I spend a lot of time just looking. I mean, yeah. I spend an awful lot of time just Absolutely. apparently staring at nothing. And I'm usually trying to work out what are those colors? Why does it? look a long way away what precisely is happening to that light on the sea at that distance and things like that I mean I was really lucky I had a mum who would ask me to describe colours when I was quite little she was quite interested oh, in that because she was a dressmaker and she liked colours and fabric and stuff like that so she was always quite into colour so I kind of had that very early on that mm. you know do you know what you're looking at can you really describe it mm. so I would say yeah do an awful lot of looking that, that's really, really helpful as well. The other thing that, that, that I find quite fascinating, um, this is, I think, comes from a lecture at university, um, that a colour is only a colour because of the one next to it. Mm. So if you are mixing a orange, just when, when you're mixing next time, just put the same orange and then take a blue or a black or a green and that same color, put another one next to it, and you'll see it looks like a completely different color, although you know it's the same one. So a color is only a color because of the other one next to it, which, which I always find so fascinating how uh, we can perceive something, you know, same thing, so different when you've got something else next to it. And that's something that's tough when you start out with lino, especially if you're doing reduction prints, because your print will change quite drastically mm. as you mm. color layer mm. and as you get more experienced you can factor for that so you can do something at the beginning of the print that will look quite weird in the knowledge mm. that by the time you've mm. got to the end of the print that will be adjusted by the colors that are coming in the future and the only way really to get your head around that i think is just to do loads of prints until you, yeah. you can kind of see that yeah, I, um, I, there's so many, really... so many prints that I've done where by the second layer, I think, oh no, and I change it. And when I get to the fourth layer, I'm like, why did I change it? Why? Because 
that first proof that I printed yeah, is actually the best instincts, one yeah. because my instinct was this is it and then my brain says no no so yeah, yeah it's a hard it's just, one it's, it is Experience. really tricky and just doing more and more of them will, mm. will get you around that I think mm, yeah, absolutely. we have some technical names for these various things oh. Yeah. Oh. atmospheric perspective yeah. that's ah, the, I like it yeah that's a good distance. one yeah. yeah absolutely and uh, colour being proximal and relative Ooh. Wow. I'm sure that's what you're talking that's about that's a beautiful here. word yeah. Prox proximal wow. And relative. It sounds edible. I'm writing that down so that I can say that in my next class that I'm teaching. So <laughs> <I can laughs> well done, yes. Well, I hope you're going I'll to also name, have to study. I hope you're going to name check Karen Marshall when you do that. Ah, there we go. Thanks, Karen. Karen, yes. Um, a, a, a little while back, while Joshua was talking about colour, um, he was touching on uh, layering, and Claire would like to know are you using transparent inks and how does that affect your layering I um, I use both so besides my primaries I have a, a white that I use um, and obviously if I'm mixing very dark colors I don't want to put a lot of white in it but um, when I'm putting white in or transparent white um, it is also a play between getting transparency or getting opaque. So um, I use both. My colors are far more uh, solid, and you have these beautiful layers. I think Nora that chip in yeah, you should just yeah, yeah. yeah. Completely different yeah. I yeah, I, I do use I I used to use an awful lot of extender. These days I use just very very thin layers with some extender um, and so I mostly am using transparent ink it's very very rare that I would roll ink thick enough to be completely opaque that's usually it when I'm at the very front of the picture but most of the time I'm rolling it out ink very very thin indeed um, and I yeah I, I sort of tend to work with lots and lots of thin layers building up colour rather than opaque ink. The price for using a lot of extender is that if you do your print and you put it away in a drawer it can go yellow, a browny yellow, um, which is something caused by the um, chromophores in the extender. This is a little bit of boring technical stuff but so it, if you print let's say a pale transparent grey and you put it in a drawer and then six months later you get that print out it could look like it's been in a pub with a lot of smokers it could be nicotine yellow that is the effect of the chromophores showing the yellow uh, without exposure to uv light so if they're away from uv light they will cause yellowing that is something you can correct by putting the print into sunlight. It will correct it very quickly and it will go away. Um, it's not an issue for prints that are on the walls, um, but it can be an issue for prints that are away in the plan chest. So um, the reason you can see it when you use lots of extender is there's no pigment to hide it. So that mm. is something that I've come up against and I'm much more aware of that now. So I tend to now use a little higher proportion of pigment in the inks that I'm, I'm mixing to get away from the extender problem. But that does mean then that I'm rolling out very, very thin layers to give that transparency. And that does give you very good transparency if you, if you roll out just very scanty layers of ink. Um, and you also sometimes get the texture of the paper coming through, which I like, but you know, not everybody likes that. So it's, it's always a balance of what you do. I'm looking at Ben as going to provide us with more questions, perhaps. There are no more questions there are no from, from, oh, from but the we, chat. We, we, but we, we did have. We did have, did there we is, have? There's one oh, there. Yeah, how do I cut detail without it all breaking and falling off? Um, well, are you meaning? Uh, I would imagine you're meaning the meaning, edges. Yeah. So. I mean, I yeah, you do get that. 
uh, on the edges, I so suppose. You really deep. Yeah, like that. yeah, I cut the liner really deep, and then often my edge would fall away, uh, I which I've never really had a problem. I think maybe um, what the lady means is if you cut something very, very fine. Oh, but what so. Angle. Mm. What I would say is, let's say you want to cut a very detailed line. So let's say you're going to cut something like the lines down at the bottom there, around there, and you want to isolate those lines and you do not want them to come off. The trick is to not cut too deep too fast. Um, mm. If you're using traditional lino, then it's a strong thing. And once you've got those lines isolated, they will hold. Um, I've got a, a plate. Um, can you reach it? It's by that bin. Can you see that big tool bit that's been pre-cut? Yeah, one. that's the one. That's the ticket. Yeah, so I have got one here that's a nice oh, example that's beautiful. of that. So if I hold that up, you can maybe see those lines there. That's the end of a print, and that's got very fine isolated lines there. Now, the print, the lino, is strong and it will it will support very fine lines isolated lines but when you're cutting them you want to cut shallow mm. and then work your way down to, to deep I think the thing is that it's it's very unnerving to cut a fine line and the temptation is to to dig in and then try and go along the edge of it usually people choose a V tool because they think that's going to be more precise and then you know to, to really um, get that cut in one because then it's dealt with and that can that can really damage the line i don't know if ben yeah. if you want to get the camera i'll show you what i mean yeah i mean i've got bits that you yeah. can see it didn't cool. quite make it there so what i'm going to do is i'm going to get ben to come and film me quickly i think we're getting a bit short on time but i will do this anyway okay so i am going to use a huge a U gouge. So inst instinctively, people tend to go for the finest tool that they they um, possess because they think that will give them more control. But actually, I'm going to use what is quite a wide U. So I'm going to cut around this little bit here, and I'm actually going to start away from that line. So I'm going to no pressure on me to be very accurate. I can go along like so. And that's going to give me a little bit of breathing space. I haven't gone very deep, but what I have done is I've given myself a nice trench. And then I can go back in that trench and I can use the side of the tool and I can actually edge up to the line with the side of the tool. And I'm in control because I've, I'm running along a trench that I've already cut. So I can just ease up to that. And I'm not going terribly deep and just take my time and just pair away at it until I'm where I want to be. And then to finally isolate it, I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. So when you get really good at this and practice, you can run along the line and be fairly accurate. But if you're just starting out and you want to be confident, you see how my other hand is supporting the tool um, and my fingers are holding the lino down. That just gives me a bit more control and I can just come at it with the side of my tool and I'm keeping it reasonably shallow and just edging up to that line. And that's just giving me that nice control and I can go as thin as I want. So here in the corner, again, I'm, going, I'm relying on that kind of snappiness of the lino that we talked about. And just easing up to it. So rather than trying to do it all and then here I'm just going to use my blade, turn around and then I can come out of that corner and get rid of those bits there. So rather <coughs> than trying to do a sort of <coughs> cut where I may be using a, a VTOL And I'm going in and it, it's quite difficult to do and it's quite accurate, hard to be accurate. You can see I've gone a bit wobbly there. And it's all sort of 
breaking and stuff if you just ease up to it fairly shallow and then if you need it deeper you can always get in there and cut away deeper if you need to so just do it in stages with the edge of the tool rather than trying to do that perfect first time cut and that will allow you to sort of ooch up to narrow lines and then they'll stay intact and then you can get them nice and deep as, as these ones are in the foreground and that's how I that's how I would do it sharp tools as well we didn't cover sharpening oh. um, but what I would say is, is if you are if you want to know about sharpening I do have YouTube films all about sharpening um, so there are several on there about stropping and also about sharpening on a whetstone so check out the, the the channel and I think there's the, there are several there of that so I think how are we doing it's I think kind of, past. yeah we are, we're kind of at, at past the hour oh no fact. oh no yes. it went so quickly um, oh no <laughs> so uh, life is but a dream it says for jelly printing Andy Skinner Andy oh. Skinner for jelly prints excellent he may be the guy that I've watched. Maybe. There's certainly one very good guy out there who does a lot of jelly stuff, which is really interesting. So, okay, so are we good. signing off? I think, I think ah, we are. Well. I'm just checking my little list. So don't forget, if you're in the area, do come and see us at Spring Fling. I think you're open uh, having a party night Friday night, aren't yep. you? You're open late on Friday oh, yeah. night. I Bubbles. am, for reasons best known to myself, doing it on Friday and Saturday night. I think because it's my first time I felt ah, keen. So that means we can come party on Saturday night. You can night. come party uh -huh. on Saturday night, yep. Um, so, yeah, if you want to join in the party, come to us in person. If you can't do that, come on Thursday and you can have a look around my show and we'll have a little chat online as well. So, yeah. And uh, as I say, there'll be a live, spring in, uh, live stream in June with Mara Cosolino, who will be talking about her Japanese woodblock and her various projects too. So that's one to look out for as well. Right, anything else? Message from our sponsors? Oh. Uh, <laughs> if we had any Come to Spring Fling, you yeah. won't regret it. <laughs> <laughs> come and live in Kukubri. Oh yeah, it. that's even better. <laughs> Yeah, we're trying to turn it into a printmaker's town. It's so. the printmaker's centre of the universe. It is. It is. Well, I know printmaker's <laughs> okay. centre of the universe. Okay. Are right, ready well, to, to shut down now? Okay, I think we are. Well, thank you everybody who's joined us. And those of you who came later to watch the recording, I hope you found it useful as well. So we'll catch you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.